Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome back to Conversations. Uh, I'm very glad to be joined again today by my old friend, Whit Ayers, the head of North Star Opinion Research, one of the most well-respected Republican, but also non-political uh, opinion polling firms in the country, but uh, and also a real st- a strategist who's been involved in many Republican campaigns, from presidential to governor and senator. Good time to be talking also because the South Carolina primary is coming up, Whit, and you I don't know if you were born there, but you started off in, in South Carolina. You were a student there and a professor there, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and a budget director there. Did I make that up? I think that's I right. I actually taught eighth grade in Greenville uh, in an earlier era, eighth grade civics and history, the toughest job I ever had. And then they I could use they could use more of that civics and history in there and elsewhere, right? right? I mean, yeah. And then I was on the faculty at the University of South Carolina, Department of Government and International Studies, and then I was in the on the governor's staff under Carol Campbell as uh, his budget and policy director. So I spent a lot of time in South Carolina. And you've done races there, right? Yes, yes, we have, uh, starting with Carol Campbell. Right, he was a good governor, yeah, different era. David Beasley and uh, a number of others in South Carolina over the years. So we're talking on February 1st. Uh, we, We last spoke at the end of August after the first Republican de- debate, I think, and of course, no no voting had taken place. We've seen Iowa, we've seen New Hampshire. We now have a two-person race. Many people thought it would take longer to get to that. Um, we have the results from Iowa and New Hampshire. We have polling from South Carolina. Where are we, just as a kind of analytical matter in this Republican primary contest? Well, we are right where we have been, which is that Donald Trump is a strong favorite to win the Republican nomination. Uh, Nikki Haley is, you know, making a good run and hanging in there. Uh, I think it's important to realize that most presidential campaigns don't end because the candidate believes they would not be particularly good in the office or they have no chance. Most campaigns end because they run out of money. And at least since the New Hampshire primary, Uh, And Donald Trump's uh, less than gracious victory speech that night, apparently Nikki Haley has been able to raise a lot of money, enough money to to keep going, at least through South Carolina and maybe through Super Tuesday. But, of course, the reality is that Donald Trump remains the odds on favor to win the nomination. You know, I I remember before New Hampshire, I thought we discussed this, not in the conversation, but but just in in our private conversations, um, that, you know, Haley probably had to get within 10 points, maybe even f- make it really close in New Hampshire to sort of really be stay alive. I do. She lost by 11, but she's a little more viable than I would have expected. Uh, maybe it's because of Trump's lack of graciousness in the speech, which probably had more effect than I realized uh, watching on election on primary night. Maybe it's because they really, I don't know if she's just hanging in there. Maybe it's because the voters, you know, maybe it's more impressive than people out there think that now consistently Trump's not been able to break what he got 51 in Iowa, 55 in New Hampshire. I don't know what he, I mean, it feels to me like it's a, I don't, Trump is the overwhelming favorite, obviously, but it feels like it's a little more of a race than I would have expected, I guess. Do do you think that's right? Yeah, he's a quasi incumbent and some 40 to 45% of Republican primary voters are voting for somebody else. Uh, This is not exactly a, a sign of overwhelming dominance when you've got almost half the party at least interested in an alternative. Uh, But of course, he remains the favorite. But it does cross my mind if he had said what I'm sure Susie Wiles and Chris LaSavita wanted him to say after the New Hampshire primary, something similar to what he said after Iowa. I congratulate Nikki Haley on a well-run race, but this primary is over and it's time to to join forces and unite the party against Joe Biden. Instead, he went on this angry rant because Nikki Haley refused to bend the knee. And it reminded all the people who are not for Trump why they're not for him. It was really an incredibly missed opportunity on on the part of the Trump campaign, I thought. Interesting. And do you think to the degree he keeps that up, it does help? Haley, at least somewhat, I mean, right, that sort of... To, oh, sure. To, I mean, yeah. he he did not get a single vote on primary night in New Hampshire that he didn't already have. And he reminded everybody who wasn't for him why they didn't want him in the first place. It was not an impressive performance. And in the Washington Post poll this morning on February 1st, it's Washington Post Monmouth, uh, 5832 for Trump, which, you know, is a little too- if you're for Haley, if you're for Haley or want Trump to be stopped, it's 
26 point margin, but it feels to me like when you see a number like that with Trump, who is, you say, is, is a virtual incumbent, and uh, the maybe 5832 ends up being more like, I don't know, 5842 in a, a final ballot. You know, one doesn't know, obviously, and there are questions of who come vote in the Republican primary, like New Hampshire. It is open in South Carolina, pretty open in South Carolina. It, uh, it is open. It's, it's an open if you primary. You voted in the, in the Democratic primary, which is this Saturday, you, you have the right to vote, you know. Right. But they don't register by party. Uh, South Carolina has changed a lot over the last 10 or 15 years. It's one of the 10 fastest growing states in the country. About 500,000 more people live in South Carolina today than did in 2010. Huge growth in Horry County along the coast. It's Myrtle Beach. Uh, also, the suburbs south of Charlotte have been booming. Uh, and Greenville is an unrecognizable town to those of us who saw it a half century ago. So it, it really is a, a growing state, but it's also clearly a very conservative state. And it's the kind of state where Donald Trump ought to do well and probably will. Yeah, if you look at the breakdowns of the likely Republican primary electorate with the caveat, we're not sure what that electorate is. It feels like it's sort of between Iowa and New Hampshire in terms of evangelicals, how many people self-identify as very conservative and so forth, right? It's That's not, correct. It's, but people do think it's a little more conservative than it is. I mean, it's not like the state didn't elect Nikki Haley and, oh, sure. and Carol Campbell. That was a little while ago. But uh, And for that matter, Lindsey Graham and Tim Scott, who whatever one thinks of some of their behavior recently, uh, um, you know, are not far right bag of Republicans, really, or to no, present no, themselves they, as that. They did not run as far right wing crazy candidates, which is one reason why they won. Speaking, I want to one more word on uh, having mentioned Tim Scott. How much does it matter that the Republican establishment has so uh, almost uniformly preemptively capitulated to Trump? I mean, if Tim Scott had stayed out of it or had uh, well, endorsed Haley, but even just said, look, I'm neutral, I respect them both. Would that give a little more oomph to the notion that it's not foreordained, that it has to be Trump? Would it make Trump a little more of a pure MAGA candidate and a little less of the candidate of everyone from his MAGA loyalists all the way through Tim Scott and, and the kind of mainstream Republicans on the Hill? Do, do you think that matters much or do people just not pay attention to those endorsements? Well, South Carolina has always been sort of an establishment state. Uh, Carol Campbell helped win the state for Bob Dole in 1996, for example. So the establishment has always played a significant role there. In some ways, it sort of plays into Nikki Haley's whole mantra, though, that you know she's the outsider running against the good old boy network. That's the way she ran in 2010 when she beat the incumbent attorney general, now the governor, uh, the incumbent lieutenant governor and an incumbent congressman from the most conservative part of the state. And she won that race going away by running against the good old boys. So in some ways it plays into her message, but it's still a very high hill to climb once you get everybody on board with Donald Trump. And maybe, yeah, that's well said. Uh, last sort of tactical question or, or South Carolina focused question. What would she need, in your opinion, to, to kind of keep going credibly through Michigan and then Super Tuesday and, and, and sort of say that, no, if Trump's at this number and I'm at this number, it's still a competition or, or have people fi say, no, it's, it can't really go on? Money in the bank. That's what, what she number needs. do you think in the results translates into money in the bank? We just, it's uh, hard to say. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm surprised that she's been able to raise as much money as she has. Uh, clearly, Donald Trump's effort to bully in donors into not giving to her backfired. Yeah, you know, when you're a billionaire, it's kind of tough to bully somebody who's got a billion dollars. And <laughs> some of them obviously resented uh, Trump's effort to bully them and up their donations to Nikki Haley. So what she needs is enough money in the bank to keep going more than any particular number on the ballot. I feel like 40, though, is a kind of nice to be in the 40s, not the 30s, right? I think it just feels oh, yeah. like Well, she more. said she'd like to do better than New Hampshire, and she did 43 in New Hampshire. So right. we'll see if she can meet that bar. And then final five, I can't resist a little bit more of the tactical stuff. It's just interesting to people like us. You know, it's, this is the... Uh, be great if we had a wide open, exciting nine way primary of the kinds that we've seen, or five way, or you know that we've seen in the past. But this is the primary we have. So, uh, what do you think? Um, everyone says, well, she can't win a state and stuff. Don't you think if she can 
let's say get 42, I'm just making this up, and then stays in, gets something like that in Michigan maybe, uh, goes to Super Tuesday then, Everyone says well, she couldn't possibly, she won't win a state. I don't know. Is that true? Uh, couldn't she win Virginia here, for example? I, I feel like she could win two or three states. She probably still has to get out at that point because then you would have overwhelming, if less things change, delegate numbers, right? That would just be, you know, pretty lopsided. But I, I feel like the notion that she could, that Trump's going to win all 50 states, I'm not so sure about that. Yeah. No, I think she could win a state or two or three here or there. The problem is California because California is winner take all um, and they have jimmied the rules in a way that really helps uh, whoever comes in first and that's likely to be donald trump and De california has such a mountain of delegates that it would create an almost insurmountable lead uh, once we get through california and that's on super tuesday california and so we so we could have numbers the day after super tuesday on TV that will show Trump with whatever, you know, just five to one leading delegates, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it would look pretty, yeah. Well, I, uh, we'll see. I don't know. How, well, how much damage, is this doing some damage to Trump? Just the fact that she's able to stay in and sort of demonstrating a little more strength than people might have expected uh, two or three months ago? Or is it sort of be forgotten once Trump wraps up the nomination, if he does, and we're on to the Trump-Biden race? Well, it shows what we've known all along. That is a minority of the Republican Party uh, that's really resistant to Trump. Uh, and it's that minority that tends to say that he, if he is convicted of a crime, they will vote elsewhere. <laughs> um, a majority of Americans would, a majority of Republicans, I mean, would stick with Trump even if he were convicted of a felony. But we've seen numbers pretty consistently that about 25% of Republicans would simply not vote for him if he were convicted. In a polarized age, you need 90% or more of your own party in order to be competitive. And if you drop that down into the mid 70s, that's a problem. It's not that they're gonna vote for Joe Biden necessarily, uh, but some of them will, but more would look to a third party candidate or write in somebody some of them would do what a lot of voters did in Georgia in 2020, and that is skip the presidential ballot and then vote down ballot, like for Republicans, which is why the Republicans could all win in Georgia in 2020 down ballot while Trump lost the state. Except in the uh, Senate races, which Trump managed to turn into a Trump race, not a normal down ballot exactly, race, right? Exactly. And, and some just wouldn't vote. So there, it's if Trump gets convicted before November, um, that's going to be a problem to wrap up the number of Republican votes and, as well as independent votes he needs uh, to win the election. Yeah, say a little more just about the numbers here. People might be skeptical also that some of those Republicans are saying they're not going to be for Trump, and they then they'll revert to him at the end, but. Um, I mean, you've looked at these numbers pretty closely, I know, in New Hampshire, and now there are numbers in the Post Bowl in South Carolina, uh, where they do push the question pretty hard. And, and you did, I think, in a poll you did of, of not just, gee, would you be unhappy if he's convicted of a crime, because you could be unhappy and still vote for him, right? But, but would you right. actually have problems voting for him? Yeah, the, the exit polls ask a question, do you think he would be fit for office if he were convicted of a crime? And you get a pretty significant number who say, yes, he would be uh, unfit for office. But that's not the real question. The real question is, would you vote for a man who has been convicted or would you vote for a man who's 82 years old whom Republicans think is senile? Uh, that's the real question. And, and that's the question we've asked. You know, who would you vote for if Donald Trump were convicted of a crime? And that's where you get the 75 percent of Republicans saying, yes, they would still vote for him against Biden, but 25 percent going elsewhere. And of that 25 percent, what, half maybe go to Biden and the other half just want something else or not even half to Biden? No, about 7 percent go to Biden, about 11 percent uh, go to third party. Uh, the rest scatter and saying they either won't vote or they'll skip the presidential ballot and vote in down ballot races. So the, really, the the trials is one big thing out there that could affect uh, people's judgments, oh, yeah. and I suppose the 
not just the conviction itself, but the prospect of conviction as the trials start, if they ever, if they ever do start. That's a question we should get the lawyers to discuss. Well, maybe, uh, it's not ahead. just the prospect of conviction. Um, if, if he goes to trial and is not found guilty, that is, if he's acquitted by just one juror out of 12 saying, I'm not convicting, so then jury. I think it's all over. It just plays right into his whole argument that this is a partisan witch hunt. So I, I think it's the outcome of the trial that is absolutely crucial. The, the testimony as well, who, who comes out and who testifies. Uh, but it's fundamentally the outcome. If he is acquitted, it's all over. It looks like a partisan witch hunt. Uh, but if he's convicted, I think we're in another world. Yeah, and the one trial that looks, I think, like, maybe still likely to, to happen in 2024 is the D.C. trial on January 6th which could have Mike Pence testifying and other interesting things. So I suppose it will be, it certainly will be very high profile, won't it? I mean, it's funny, right. you know, we usually analyze these campaigns and we, it's all campaign tactics. Will this issue be bigger? Or if there's a foreign policy crisis, would that help McCain against Obama? All the kind of usual stuff that for a few days people focus on, which tends to fade actually. And the, the I think you would agree with this. I think you've argued this, that the the underlying kind of dynamics, the you know, of the race reassert themselves after a little bit of a blip. Some, someone has a bad debate, he's up two or three points, then it goes back to where, where the race wanted to be all along, so to speak. It does feel like you think the trial really is a different category of than having a bad debate or, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, it, is Mark Meadows going to testify? He's been awfully quiet, you know. But you've, you've got to actually get to a trial uh, and this latest brouhaha over whether the president has absolute immunity, uh, I can't imagine going Trump's way, but it has caused more delay in the trial. And the classified documents trial is, from a legal standpoint, I think, the strongest of all of them. Uh, but you have a much more Trump sympathetic judge in Eileen Cannon. Uh, Fort Pierce, Florida jury is likely to be more sympathetic to Trump. But the actual facts of the case are pretty devastating. You know, they, they didn't charge Trump for any classified documents that he voluntarily returned, just like they didn't charge Biden or Pence on any classified documents they voluntarily returned. They only charged him on those documents he hid, not just from the government, but from his own attorney, so that your attorney couldn't tell the government he had classified documents. So... That, that is a pretty powerful case that you refuse to return classified documents when asked and pressed for them. Uh, and so it's a, it's a pretty tough legal argument to get away from, I think. But who knows if that will go to trial? I mean, that could be pushed out past the November election. Yeah, it looks like Judge Cannon is doing that. And without impugning her motives, it's certainly helpful to Trump to do that, to push it past the election. So it may, he, may, he may owe Judge Cannon big time if he, if he, if he wins this election. Oh, Supreme right. Court seat, baby. There you go. Uh, can you imagine? Um, God. When, on the general, what if we also, I guess, one hears two different things, and I think both are somewhat true. I'm curious what you, how you weigh them in the balance. And Trump's run a pretty disciplined campaign, really on some issues at least. His team seems pretty competent. They've, they, they, you know, they're not, uh, it doesn't seem chaotic, quite as chaotic as it was in 2016. And of course, you don't have the pandemic, thank God, so far. So you don't have the 2020 kind of craziness. Uh, on the one hand, it's, you know, they, they know what they're doing. On the other hand, the election night speech in New Hampshire, some of the other stuff that Trump and his close allies are, are doing and pushing seems a little self-indulgent, let's say, and, and maybe Trump's a little more that way than he was before. That's sort of what Nikki Haley's been saying. I supported him in the past, but he's not as sent, he's not as grounded or he's more chaotic and somewhat confused. Which of these two is more true? To, are you more impressed by Trump as a candidate or think that six, eight months of Trump as a, as a candidate, if he sews it up, let's say on March 5th, he may lose, not, you know, he's in a, everyone knows him, right? So he's not going to, won't be massive movement based on some speech he gives or some stumble he makes or some insult he hurls. But could he, do you think he gains a point or two because of the discipline of the campaign or loses a point or two because of him being Trump? Well, there's no question that Susie Wiles and Chris LaSavita know what they're doing. I've worked with them both. They're good, solid, professional operatives. Um, but Controlling Donald Trump is a fool's errand. 
And he seems to have some difficulty controlling himself, like we saw on the night of the New Hampshire primary. So who knows what he's going to do or say over the course of an eight-month campaign. Uh, I don't know. I don't think they know. And I'm pretty sure Donald Trump doesn't know. Uh, So it's a much more disciplined campaign. But seeing Trump in the spotlight as a potential president again for eight months uh, may not necessarily work in his favor. I mean, and even if it only moves a point or two or three, that's that's important. Yeah, this thing's on a knife's edge. Well, it's let's not talk at the then moment. About- it's not at the moment. <laughs> I mean, if this election were held today, Donald Trump would win in a landslide in the Electoral College. I mean, it's pretty clear right now how. But that's a function of Biden's weakness rather than Trump's strength. So let's get to President Biden, since these races are not are, are races about two or more candidates, not about one. Um, yeah. So what you just said is I mean, there's some I'd say among Biden friends, with whom I, Biden fans with whom I speak, um, Biden supporters, there's a little bit more optimism now than there was a month or two ago. A couple of national polls look decent. Um, you're, you're not a believer in that. So talk about Without, that. Well, there's no reason for the Biden forces to feel more optimistic today. Uh, the poll that came out today, uh, Bloomberg Morning Consult, consult uh, Wisconsin, Trump up eight, Nevada, Trump up 12, Michigan, Trump up six, Georgia, Trump up seven, North Carolina, Trump up 13, Arizona, Trump up eight, Pennsylvania, Trump up three. Trump would win in a landslide in the Electoral College if the election were held today. And the reason is, that Joe Biden is the weakest American president since Jimmy Carter. And there's some similarity between the two men. Both of them defeated, weakened Republican incumbents, Gerald Ford in the case of Jimmy Carter, who was very unpopular after he pardoned Nixon. And Biden defeated Trump after a chaotic first term. But both have conducted themselves in a way that has led a majority of Americans to disapprove of their job performance. And Biden is starting to get that Carter feel. And by that, I mean that the world is coming apart and he seems incapable of affecting events in any sort of positive way. And that was the feeling people started to get about Jimmy Carter after the Iranian hostage crisis, that he just was incapable of affecting events. And you're starting to get that feel with Joe Biden, too, that he is just unable to affect events in a positive way, whether it's Ukraine or immigration or the Middle East. Um, It just feels like events are out of control and Biden is a bystander watching events spin out of control. And, And once that perception settles in, it becomes incredibly difficult to change it. And I've seen nothing over the last few months to change that perception about Joe Biden. I mean, he's got two huge vulnerabilities. In addition to the foreign policy crisis and the crisis at the border and the economy that people don't think is any good, the most important one is that the vast majority of Americans, including a vast majority of Democrats, think he's just too old to serve effectively in his mid-80s in the most difficult job in the world. And the second vulnerability is that virtually no one in either party thinks that Kamala Harris is ready for prime time. The White House is fond of saying, well, a lot can change in the course of eight months. Well, that's true. But what won't change is Joe Biden is not going to get any younger, any more physically vigorous or any sharper mentally, and Kamala Harris is not going to get any more ready to be president of the United States. There's nothing they can do about either one. And it's amazing to me that Democrats at this point have gone along so meekly. And I wonder, I wonder how much longer they're going to continue to go along with a ticket that looks like a sure loser in the fall. They'll tell themselves it's not a sure loser. That will be the reason for continuing to go along, maybe, right? There's, there's an awful lot of hopium on the Democratic side, I can. I hopium, can huh? <laughs> That's a good but, phrase for it. Yeah, well, I didn't invent it, but. Uh, oh, anyway. Also known as whistling past the graveyard. The, yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, 
you know, I just I want to get to the age thing and the, and how they all relate in a way these things, and then and then talk about what the implications are for the next eight months. But you know, I think the bystander point is an important point that people don't grasp enough. There's sort of a tendency to analyze this and, well, on this issue. He's not he's unpopular. You know, that's the way the pollsters typically ask it, right? What do you do? You agree with the Democrats or the Republicans or with Biden on immigration, on the economy? Or do you approve of his job performance on you know Russia and Ukraine or or the economy or immigration or or whatever? But voters don't. Qu- I mean, that's important. But voters don't quite think of it that way. I think, and I do think that the notion that he's just a bystander and you don't want a president who's just a bystander is important. I think the other presidents who won re-election, people didn't agree with them often on on many issues actually, and they knew they'd made mistakes. But there was a sense that they were kind of on top of things. I think it's fair to say, and and that they were controlling things each in their own different style. Reagan was different from Obama, obviously. Bush was different from his father. Well, his father lost, but Bush was different from Clinton, let's say. But there was a sense in each case. I think that they were running the government and sort of on top of events and uh, controlling events to some degree. And I do. I'm struck by the bystander point. I mean, there's these. So these. Uh, this is a small issue. Well, not a small issue, but a, maybe a small example, but. So this Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan package, and then the border deal, and they're combining them, they may not combine them. It's, and people like me follow it, and most people don't, I presume, in this you know, four months of back and forth and nothing's happened yet. But I am struck how much of, you know, you read these articles and it's Mitch McConnell thinks this, and, and Jim Langford's trying to put the deal together, but so-and-so, but Speaker uh, Johnson's against it. It's like, isn't there a president? I mean, doesn't he have something to say about the can't you use some muscle to rally public opinion and and get stuff to happen on one thing that's a very important priority for him, Ukraine, and another, the border, where he's not, you know, where he's been had to change his position because it's uh, rightly or wrongly he's viewed as ineffectual and stuff. But if you're going to be viewed as ineffectual, you should do something to make yourself not viewed that way. I guess I'm just struck by, again, the absence more than, it's more than the details of do people like this part of the bill or that part of the bill and sort of a where's Biden problem. Do you, do you yeah, have that uh, sense too? And I think that's true on well, Ukraine. Sure. I mean, Ukraine, as he says, is the inflection point for the world. And then, I don't know, he hasn't given any major speeches on Ukraine that I know of in the last few months. Yeah. Well, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, a discharge petition is hard to get in the House over the objection of the Speaker, but it's not impossible if you get all the Democrats and a chunk of Republicans who would really like to see a border deal and would really like to see money go to Ukraine. So there is possible for a gifted president who can affect events to make things happen. And, and that's what I'm talking about. It's that Jimmy Carter syndrome that he can't seem to affect events in a positive direction, uh, that he's basically impotent to make things happen. And, and that is a devastating perception to settle into the public consciousness. And it's one of the things that allowed Reagan to win a landslide victory over Jimmy Carter in 1980. And I suppose the age dovetails with that, right? That of course it does. Feeds that's... right into the age, you know? <laughs> he's, he's too old to make things happen, is, is the way it'll, it'll get translated. Yeah. No, I've been, uh, well, he's, he's done a good job of scaring other you know, Democrats away from running and of resisting calls that he voluntarily step aside and... Um, and then the, the one, two punch, I guess it's one, two, three punch is what you're saying, really, of age, Vice President Harris. You know, age could be handled somewhat if your vice, if everyone loved your, was confident in your vice president. Um, but that's not the case. Or if you, things were going swimmingly and people thought things were going swimmingly and you could kind of, in effect, I think this is Reagan 84 is a little bit of this, that, you know, you could afford to have a president who was a little bit uh, going to not be as vigorous as a 55 year old in his second term, but directionally things were going well. And he had a very good team with him and he knew what he was doing on the big issues, economy and Soviet Union, basically. And George Shultz and Jim Baker and others were there and people had a vague sense. And I'm also struck by that a little. Again, voters don't focus on who the Secretary of State or the Secretary of Treasury is or Chief of Staff, but people had the sense, my vague memory is in 84, that you know, for all because there was a lot of chaos in the Reagan administration, honestly, in Reagan White House, that it was sort of, there were people, serious people there whom they vaguely knew about, who'd been in government a long time, who were, you know, and and I personally respect Janet Yellen and Tony Blinken and stuff, but no one, I mean, they're not uh, out there the way Schultz and Baker uh, were, right? I mean, Weinberger, they were sort of 
I, I was a little struck. <clears throat> Biden's not, they haven't run the administration in a way that's allowed the cabinet secretaries to give Biden much help, you know? Yeah. And you're, you're exactly right. The Kamala Harris exacerbates the age problem. It's true that people don't vote for the vice president. They vote for the top of the ticket. But we've seen evidence in relatively recent years that people might vote against the top of the ticket because they're worried about the vice president. They'd vote against a vice president. John McCain lost votes because people were worried about putting Sarah Palin one heartbeat away from the presidency. So people can vote against a ticket because of worries about the vice president, even though ultimately they vote for the top of the ticket if it's a positive vote. So let's talk about, let's assume two Super Tuesdays, March 5th. So at that point, Biden hasn't pulled out of the race and has, <clears throat> excuse me, and has, of course, won every every Democratic primary overwhelmingly. Uh, Trump, let's just say, has won the huge majority pretty comfortably and has a massive delegate lead. And so they're the nominees, even whether whether Nikki Haley stays in another uh, round or two or three or, or till the end, for that matter. But the, the country sort of wakes up March 6th and says, OK, it's a Trump-Biden race what is what happened i mean it's the longest it'll be the longest general election campaign ever with the least wished for candidate matchup ever is that right i think that's right two-thirds of americans absolutely dread the thought of a trump biden rematch two-thirds and that includes you know, a majority of both Democrats and Republicans and almost 80 percent of independents want better choices. So who knows what happens? It certainly doesn't increase belief and trust in our political system. Um, I've been very skeptical that a third party could be anything more than a spoiler, uh, and I still think I'm there. But you have to wonder if it's two thirds of the country doesn't want either one of these guys if there might not be the possibility of a third party having more effect than they've had in the past. I still am skeptical. Uh, I'll have to be convinced, but it just sort of feels like there's a vacuum there that somebody might be able to fill and start tapping into the resistance, the widespread resistance to a Trump-Biden rematch. Yeah, I've been skeptical too, and I, I guess I remain skeptical that the third party would be likely or even uh, have an outside chance at winning, maybe a very small chance. But that doesn't mean someone doesn't get in or some different combinations of people don't get in in March, April. Everyone knows about the no labels, possible you know ballot line, but there are, it's not that hard as an independent candidate to get on Maybe it's a little hard to get on all 50 states, but not hard to get on 40 plus states, even if you start in uh, May, let alone uh, March or April. And I, you've yeah. got to think people are looking at that, whether they're retired politicians of both parties, business people, retired military, enter, I don't know, celebrities, entertainers, Schwarzenegger types, Perot types, whatever, and thinking, I don't know, why not take a shot? And especially if you're not now... If you're terrified of a Trump presidency and you just think it's got to be, if it's not Biden, it's going to be Trump, you you, you would resist that. Uh, and a lot of my friends would resist that. And I'd be inclined to, too. But that doesn't mean they would res resist it. Right? I guess I, what I'm saying is I, I feel like even if that person doesn't win, it, it could be a Perot type situation where someone gets in, uh, does well enough to be qualified for debates. If there are debates, gets a lot of press. I don't know which way that cuts. I mean, do you... We talk it depends about on who it is. It, it depends totally on who it is. But it can't be just, you know, one of these gadfly candidates. It, it'd have to be someone of substance, someone of reputation, uh, and someone whom people believe could be a credible president of the United States. Uh, but if someone like that did decide to make a serious run and were very well funded, um, you, you suspect they could do a whole lot better than most third party candidates have. Ross Perot set the standard in 1992. He got 19% of the popular vote. Of course, he got zero electoral votes because he couldn't come up with a majority in any state. And that's, that's the big dilemma for a third party candidate with the electoral college is coming up with enough votes to win 
some electro votes. Yeah, I mean, and in you throw it into the house, and you've got more chaos. Well, if you get some electoral <laughs> votes, yeah. The, uh, I mean, in '92, the, the exit polls suggested that pro voters said that if he hadn't been running, they would have split evenly, basically between Bush and Clinton, with a fair number saying they wouldn't have voted. But I, as having been in that Bush White House um, at the time, I felt Perot did a lot of damage to Bush. I mean, at the end oh, of the yeah. day, people can say what they want uh, after they vote, but in the dynamics of the campaign. It legitimated the, the, this Republican-ish, a Republican really, Texas business person who had been a huge supporter of veterans and pretty conservative, was running on the budget deficit after all, right? I mean, appealing, did not look like a lefty, you know, <laughs> yeah. protest candidate. The fact that this guy was saying Bush is unacceptable, the incumbent's unacceptable, and I'm running, uh, reinforced, you know, already well, problems we already had in the Bush administration of convincing people we deserved a second term and and all and and the end of the Cold War and he wasn't he didn't need a foreign policy president anymore all that together, but I, I think Pro did a lot of damage to Bush in the dynamics of the campaign, um, and in on the debate stage for that matter. And so yeah. I you guess that really convince. brings home your point about who the independent candidates are. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you'll never convince the George H.W. Bush forces that Perot did not cost Bush right. the presidency. They're absolutely convinced that he did. And so we kind of, who's the incumbent? I mean, that's one question, right? That this, you know, who's the, is this ref, election going to be a, a referendum on Biden or on Trump? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is 1892 all over again. <laughs> this is Grover Cleveland versus Benjamin Harrison. You know, a former president versus a current president. And we really haven't had anything comparable since 1892. Uh, Grover Cleveland came back and defeated the guy who had beaten him. So he is our only president to serve two terms non-consecutively. Uh, but that's exactly what Donald Trump is trying to do today. Uh, I wish we had some exit polls from 1892. It would really inform us today, but that was well before the era of public opinion polling, unfortunately. Yeah, that's right. I actually, I'm going to go read something about I don't know, their historians have written about that period and that election, I'm sure. And I, have, we all know what you, well, we all know, but we, what you just said is, is, you know, something one knows sort of at, at the level of the headline, you know, the old first time in, since the late 19th century that there's been the two incumbents in effect running against each other. And, and it was a reversal then. But I would actually be curious to look at the 1892, the rhetoric of that campaign and, you know, how much of it, how much of it was about Harrison's performance in office and how much of it was about Cleveland's, I guess, somewhat unsatisfactory performance in his first term, which caused him to lose. And obviously it's not like Trump and it's not like Biden and all that, but it would be an interesting little, uh, you know, hour or two to spend reading some American history, I guess. Yeah. Grover Cleveland won the Democratic nomination on the first ballot against pretty serious people, uh, former governor, senator from New York, senator from Iowa, or, or governor of Iowa. So pretty serious people, but he did win the nomination on the first ballot and go on to defeat the guy who'd beaten him. In 92, yeah. And, in yeah. 1892. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm, 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 that's my assignment after this is to read up on the 1892 92 election. But I mean, if you were advising the the Trump campaign and the Biden campaign, how do they make it more? I take it either one has, either campaign has to, they're not going to change their, Trump's not going to become accept, suddenly a favorite of a huge number of independents and Biden's not going to suddenly become, move his presidential approval rating from 40 to 50%. So how do they make it about the other candidate? I mean, as an actual campaign, experienced campaign operative, what's the, what's the. It's, it's just all a negative campaign that convinces voters that, their guy is the lesser of the two evils. Uh, it will not be an inspiring campaign uh, that we will look back on fondly, I'm afraid. And if people see that, don't you think, in March and April, it increases the chances of a you know, third party, unity, bipartisan, positive vision for the future, next generation? Yep. Yeah, they, the next generation part is important too. I, I mean, Haley's begun to hit on that. I wonder if they have some sense that that's working or not. But you know, she has an add up. I think that w w with both uh, Trump and Biden in it, I can't remember what exactly the punchline is, but it's you know, time. You don't want these grumpy old men back or something like that. I don't know if that. Really yeah, happens. yeah. No, it's it. It is a powerful argument that it's time to move on and that 
she is the only person standing in the way of a Trump-Biden rematch that the vast majority of Americans dread. It's a good argument. The problem is <laughs> it might work in a general election electorate. The question is whether you could, she can make it work in a Republican primary electorate. But I suppose we'll learn. I mean, it would be in that respect the next uh, month. I mean, until Super Tuesday it could be the more people vote for him, the more independents who go out of their way to vote for Haley in South Carolina or Michigan or Virginia or other states, I suppose would be a bit of an indicator, right, of the. the oh, yeah. Yeah, the, the independent vote is critical. In 2016, Donald Trump got 46% of the independent vote in his victory over Hillary Clinton. In 2020, he got 41% of the independent vote in his loss to Joe Biden. And in New Hampshire, he got 39% of the independent vote. So at least based on New Hampshire, he is not performing at the level among independents that he did in his victory in 2016. Yeah, that's interesting. And uh, I haven't really seen that, uh, that analysis. That's, and the independents we're talking about in New Hampshire, if I'm not mistaken, would be those who chose to vote in the Republican primary. Who are undeclared. Which included a lot of the unaffiliated, un, un, what are they called, unaffiliated in New Hampshire, I guess? Yeah. Un undeclared. Undeclared. Is what they yeah. call them. Yeah. But, um, and that would include a lot of normal, let's say, Democratic-leaning independents who went over to vote against Trump, and there was an effort, uh, uh, which I was a little involved in, to, to encourage people to do that. But still, it, it wouldn't include a lot of, a fair number of independents who were Democratic independents. And so that 39 is actually weaker even than than it sounds like, right, in a way, when you think about it, right? Yeah. There's, there's some other so, independents out there who just voted for Biden or something or didn't vote, you know, so yeah. in the De primary. Democrats... So. D Democrats couldn't vote in the GOP primary right. in New Hampshire. They had to change their party registration by but Democratic October leaning independents, you know, right. some some did, but not all, presumably yeah. some of them. As couldn't. long as they're undeclared, they could have right. voted but in some the of them couldn't quite probably get themselves to do it if they were right. basically Democrats who just registered as undeclared. So so that's that a real weakness of Trump. Maybe that's an interesting I mean, people are so I mean Biden's weak in, in the ways we've said, but I suppose that Trump weakness is maybe under estimated a little, do you think? I mean, among the sort of... Uh... Oh, that that's... I can make a powerful argument why neither one of those men can win the presidency. <laughs> but the ch chances are pretty good that one of them's going to. Yeah, you do find... And this is where you just don't know how much this sort of system, it has various reason, uh, constraints on third parties, and we've all had occasions when there, no one liked either candidate much, but, but ended up choosing between those two candidates, mostly... But I think uh, ne never as much as today, right? I mean, do you realize? Do you agree with that? Never in our lifetime, yeah. certainly. Nothing like not this. in our lifetime. No, because we not. never had a circumstance like this in our lifetimes with a former president running against a current president, a, a former president facing ninety-one felony counts. I mean, there are all kinds of completely different dynamics in this race that none of us have ever been through before. Which does make one wonder when, if on March six. The whole country wakes up to the realization that unless something dramatic happens, that we're now looking at this race that you've just described, that something dramatic might happen, right? I mean, presumably politics abhors a vacuum and, you know, uh, supply creates its own demand or whatever, whatever cliche one wants that might lead something to happen. I, I guess I, I'm more, just as we talk, I'm a little more convinced of the possibility, not of a independent candidate necessarily winning the presidency or even winning electoral votes, but of a much more serious uh, independent candidate or candidates, you know, seriously considering running, I guess I'd put it that way. I mean, yeah, I, this election may be decided by events that haven't happened yet. And I wish I had a crystal ball and could look clearly into the future and see what was coming. Uh, but I'm afraid uh, we're, we're pretty good pollsters at North Star Opinion Research, but we're not quite that good. Yeah. And so, yeah, the thing, and we'll mention, since you mentioned things like, what would, in, in terms of the real world events, which is another set of things that haven't happened yet, anything in particular from your experience or analysis of the, of the opinion polls now that particular vulnerability is on each side, if you had to sort of, if you could snap your fingers and make one thing happen or not happen, either for Joe Biden or Donald Trump in, in the real world, in the economy, immigrate border, Ukraine, I don't know, does one matter more than others? I mean, 
What did you well, say? I mean, we're, we're still talking about changes at the margins when we're talking about things like the economy getting better and Joe Biden being more trusted on the economy than Donald Trump, which he is not right now. Uh, but that's so overwhelmed by the age problem and the Kamala Harris problem that it's it's hard to see that kind of thing making a significant difference. Um, you know, it's, it's more likely to be some kind of health event affecting either one of these guys or some kind of unexpected violent event uh, that affects either one of them. I, I just, I don't know. And, and that's why it feels, while it looks so certain on the surface, it feels uncertain beneath the surface. Yeah, that's well, that's well said. Uh, you've mentioned Vice President Harris a few times. What about Trump's VP pick? Is that make a difference or you just try to yeah. avoid too I, much trouble? Yeah, just do no harm. <laughs> that's the first and, order of business. Do no harm. And you think he'll follow that? He's not going to pick Marjorie Taylor Greene or something? No, no. But he might pick Elise Stefanik. Yeah, but he might view that as do no harm. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, right, I mean. I don't know if she would do any harm, incidentally. Um, I mean, I guess like Christine Ohm or something would be safer. But I guess we don't get a Nikki Haley pick. It's not going to be a Reagan-Bush situation, you don't think? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine it. Not not at this stage. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. You don't, I mean, we're, and I guess, I mean, we've been through races. I remember I was on TV some, a lot in 2008. And there were Republicans who watched the Obama-Clinton race go on and on and on. And people forget it went on till the end. And it, it wasn't did. entirely settled till the end. It and did. it was pretty tough. I mean, it wasn't a, such a, they ended up being, you know, she served in this administration and so forth, but it didn't feel that way. And there were people, oh, this is, and there were actual polling that show, you know, certain X percentage of Clinton voters wouldn't vote for Obama. They were very offended by the way she'd been treated, she, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I remember I, this case, rare case, I was actually right. I said, they're all going to end up voting for Obama. This is like total hopium that we're from among Republicans at this long drawn out race, whereas McLean it had clinched by mid-March, I think, um, is going to really help much in the general and the di underlying dynamics of the underlying dynamics. And then, of course, we had the financial crisis that it all, uh, that was confirmed the underlying dynamics. But um, it, I feel like the Haley thing is a little different. I mean, it's not like Obama Clinton, right? I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's no, somehow. It, it yeah. reflects a resistance in the Democratic Party to Donald Trump coming back. Republican. Um, Party. Republican Party, excuse me, yeah. uh, for Donald Trump coming back. Uh, but, but uh, Bill, I, I need to revise and extend my remarks. We were talking about things that might affect the election, uh, I, I neglected to mention that a Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey endorsement of Joe Biden would make it over. I mean, that that then it becomes a done deal. You know, um, Taylor Swift and, and Kelsey are, you know, part of this psyops thing. The deep state <laughs> is coming to uh, endorse Joe Biden. And, and that would probably have a, a dramatic effect on the outcome. I know what I mean, what a. We have such a com weird combination of such a serious moment in our history and <laughs> such a, like a public discourse, which is slightly crazy, honestly. Uh, I mean, it's... Uh, let, uh, let me get this straight here. The Republicans have had disappointing elections in 2018, 2020, 2021 in Georgia, and 2022. So the way to get majority support is to attack the most famous and most popular woman in the entire world, coupled with a superstar of America's favorite sport. And this is supposedly going to help expand the Republican coalition? I mean, please. I, I wish there were an IQ bank where I could suggest these people go and take out a large loan. But I'm afraid that's not possible. But it's just kind of bizarre, some of the stuff that comes on the Internet. It, it just seems like the Internet is this magnet for people who want to look foolish in the eyes of the world. And there are plenty of people who give in to that tendency. It's pretty amazing. But also, I do think, I mean, MAGA is much more extreme, honestly, and conspiratorial than previous very conservative 
elements of the party, mostly not, there were some extremely conspiratorial ones, but there were plenty of conservatives who didn't like, I don't know, aspects of popular culture. I was uh, talked about this the other day on a different, uh, uh, on, a, on a podcast, I mean, the Murphy Brown with Dan Quayle, probably ill-advised, honestly, but it was fine. We were making a point about family breakup and family structure, and, and he gave a serious speech in which he quoted for a sentence or two, made a point that you know, Hollywood shouldn't make, make light of these, uh, the importance of having two parents at home and so forth. But there was no conspiracy theory. There was no, you know, uh, personal attack on Candace Bergen or something like that. You know, there wasn't an obsession about it. It was a line that got, and then it became a big deal for three or four days and didn't end up mattering, I think, honestly. And and that was, or Tip Gore criticized, you know, rap lyrics. And, you know, it was a reasonable point she had that it was maybe these were the best. Um, but that's so different, that kind of, you know, cultural criticism, you might call it, or a little, you know, middle brown conservative hostility to Hollywood than the kind of ins- the conspiracy insanity that we now have. And I, so I, I think that is, it's an internet thing, but it is a MAGA thing in particular. I mean, you don't see as much of this on the, you know, the, among 40% of Democrats thinking that, I don't know what, that there are psyops going on on the other side or something. You might see it among the, some on the left, but but uh, it is it is pretty, so Trump, I would say, let's close on this and let's come back to Trump. Trump sort of resists this. I, I am sort of struck by that, that Trump, Trump does not want to be at war with major Amer- popular American institutions. Trump did not attack Disney. Trump did not attack the NFL. Trump liked be called Tom Brady. Remember when he was actually president, he was watching football games. He was calling Tom Brady. He's sort of, he understands that he wants to be in sync with kind of much of, especially much of old fashioned, you know, American I don't know what popular culture, Americana, you know that kind of thing. Um, mainstream is, America. I mean, mainstream yeah. America loves Taylor Swift and loves NFL football. Yeah, it does show make you wonder what happens afterwards. The MAGA is sort of escapes kind of Trump's. Uh, not for now in this general in this election, I think. But you know, there's a part of my MAGA that's kind of out of Trump's orbit by now and is really into a kind of you know uh, info wars world. The Trump is catered to and brought into in a very responsible way, in my opinion, you know, uh, done a lot of damage by making, by legitimizing them. But that's his, he's been pretty good at straddling, right? I mean, it being, he's got all those people with him. But then if you're, if you want to convince yourself that, oh, come on, he's, you know, he's a little bit of a loud mouth, but basically he's going to govern in a fairly normal Republican way and so forth. And, you know, he's done a pretty good job of straddling that. That will be a bit of a challenge, I think, for him going forward. He's, um, and then his personality of just, you know, wanting to attack Nikki Haley in pretty unattractive ways. And you've got to think some people react against that, right? I don't know. We'll, we'll see. He, <laughs> we'll he did set, set up his own vice president uh, to be murdered by a violent mob. So um, right. that, that is something that kind of sticks in people's minds. You would think, not that it helped Mike Pence against Trump in the primaries, right? I mean, it's kind of amazing that uh, January 6th has almost disappeared. Well, follow me, we close on that. I mean, this made my own obsession, January 6th. But I mean, why aren't, why is no one talking about January 6th? The guy who was responsible for it, who incited it, who organized it to the degree it was a serious effort, and it was to some degree, who tried to sort of overturn the results of an election, is running for president and no one... Uh, I don't know. It's like not an issue. I mean, it's, but Biden will make it an issue, I, I believe. But it's sort of startling how little it's in. Taylor Swift is much more in the American public discourse than January 6th, right? Yeah. Well, the, we've had three years of people downplaying the significance and importance of the first effort in American history to overturn an election. Uh, and it's pretty stunning. Uh, but it is what it is. Would have been different, don't you think, if the Senate had convicted or if more people had gone in, let's call it a Liz Cheney direction of taking it really fundamentally seriously instead of sort of accommodating it. Yeah. But they didn't. (laughs) Well, they want to get reelected. They want to keep their seats. In In primaries, especially. Yep. Well, it sounds like we have to reconvene. We have to see what, ha- I guess my, my takeaway from this, but I want you to give the final takeaway, the more serious one, since you've, you've, you've been through this but so many times and are so thoughtful about it is, yeah, the, you know, how quickly Trump can kind of wrap it up, how quickly he, he clinches it and, and, and people just think it's too hopeless to continue contributing to Haley and how quickly Haley decides to give up. But if that's March 5th, which I think is the most likely 
maybe date, maybe March 12th, like she stays in another week, but, um, and the American public looks up and it's Biden, Trump. I do think that's a very interesting moment, you know, that people haven't quite thought about enough about what, what does it really look like? And, and, uh, I don't know. I, I feel like it's just, it, it, as you say, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's the same old, same old on the surface, but underneath, I mean, so much resistance to it. Um, yep. I'll, I'll say one last thing, just because of, the resistance to Biden, which I use the term used, is is very striking to me. I mean, that is, I've, I was talking with a couple of Democratic members actually the other day, moderate Dems in districts that are kind of swingish districts, and um, their own polling. A, it confirms what you say. They, they won't say this publicly, but Biden is running in their polling about three points, four points behind where he ran in uh, 2020, which would only put him even, it would be okay. It's not quite as, you know, it could be even in the popular vote, but that if you, that may, you lose all the very close states if you, if you yeah. give up three or four Not points. even in the electoral college, not even right. close. Right. And these people are sort of running five, seven points ahead of Biden in their own districts. Mm -hmm. um, and they think they'll hang on if Biden can keep it close, but not if he, not if it uh, erodes a little more. But they used to say informally that a lot of their own supporters, these are Democrats, uh, they're going to vote for them, for these Democratic candidates. They're going to vote, they, they hate Trump and they're going to vote against Trump. Um, you know, they certainly don't hate, or at least they, they don't want to be Trump president again. But they say to these people, but if, so who's the Democratic nominee going to be? And, you know, they, these members of Congress say, well, President Biden. And so, well, isn't something going to happen? They, they've worked, they'll work out a way to, to change that, right? I mean, they'll work out a way to have some, you know, at the convention or something, he'll step aside and it will be that governor of Michigan, whatever her name is, or, or someone else who I've seen on TV a little bit. You know, I mean, it, the degree to which I think voters have not come to grips with the fact that it's, Biden Trump is maybe a little greater than those of us inside the Beltway who, you know, m most of people here have come to grips with it or think they've come to grips with it or have, have acceded to it. And Resigned I was struck by to that. It, maybe. <laughs> What's that? Resigned to it. Yes. Perhaps. Yes. But I don't have the impression that the voters out there quite have have gone and they may not get so resigned. Right. Who knows? That's the great conundrum right now. That's a good a good note to end on, even though it's uh, people, of course, want wisdom from you and they want the crystal ball. What's the point of all that polling if you can't uh, <laughs> perfectly predict what's going to happen over the next uh, yeah. eight, nine months? Wish, wish we could, Bill, but afraid that's beyond our powers of public opinion research. I mean, my takeaway from this is, though, that actually March, April may become quite important because, A, we have the question of, is there a serious third party, which is very important, and, and how much voters just look up and yep. kind of shudder at at uh, Trump v. Biden, assuming that he, he Trump does sort of dispose of Haley pretty, pretty quickly. Um, so A, there's that question, third party, let's call it question, uh, revulsion at Trump Biden question. Uh, but B, there's the trials. I mean, I think we'll know by May whether the trial is not what's happened and it will have happened in the trial, but whether the trial, any of these trials will even happen in right. 2024. So I feel like we'll have a the unusual, usually you get these nominees picked in March or whatever, and then there's a bit of a lull and then everyone focuses again as the conventions happen and nothing much, nothing obvious at least happens in those uh, March, April, May months. But I feel like a lot, of, at least on both the trials front and the uh, third party front, March, April, May become pretty important months, right? I agree. I agree. Particularly so on the trial front, we will tell a whole lot about what's going to happen with those trials in March, April, and May, I think. So we need to have a Memorial Day conversation and really see All what right. I'm game. Stand. Good. Wit Ayers, uh, thanks again for really an interesting and thought-provoking conversation. Always a pleasure, Bill. Happy to be with you. And thank you for joining us on Conversations.